A very good evening to you and welcome to Monday's News. In tonight's bulletin, top stories, former Petroleum and Energy Minister Francis Potape sentenced to two and a half years. Also, MTV announces broadcasting rights to Cricket World Cup and tuition fee-free education to continue next year. But before that, since MTV reported on the brutal attack of a G4S security guard by Chinese nationals at Nine Mile in Port Moresby, police have reacted and arrested six, six suspects. There are now a growing number of calls from the public to re-engage the special task force set up to look into illegal immigrants and businesses in the country. Chief Secretary to the government, Sir Manasupe Zurino, gave the government's position on the issue this afternoon. According to NCD Central Police Commander ACP Jerry Frank, all six suspects have been refused bail and further investigations will be conducted on the work entry and work permits of the three foreign nationals by the Labor and Immigration Department. The suspects were taken to Barocco Police Station for further questioning. The suspects were arrested for assaulting a G4S security guard in December of 2014. However, it was only last week that the suspects were arrested because there wasn't a formal police complaint in the first instance. This incident escalated public anger on the voice of PNG Page. It has drawn the attention of the task force that was set up to look into illegal immigrants, bridge contracts, among others. Chief Secretary Semana Supe said the government is reconsidering, re-engaging this special task force. That, 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 that's been considered, but we'll have to get a we're waiting for a basically a say a report from the chief chief migration officer now line long look look at the previous uh, operations the volume experience long so i'm sorry man must work but talk 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 sal bridget comatep national mtv news second-hand vendors at the malaro market in ncd have lost properties worth thousands of kina after police burnt down their makeshift shelters today the police, ac police action comes after continuous negligence by vendors selling bitter nuts and cheap technological accessories in the market's area. Vendors who lost their properties to fire said it was the action of a few that has now caused suffering for them all. Police raided the market at midday and took down all makeshift shelters used by the vendors to sell second-hand clothes, mobile phones and manufactured goods. Some of the shelters and their properties were burned to ashes. The actions of the police have not gone down well with some informal vendors, whilst others said it had become necessary. The police raided the market because betel nut smugglers are illegally selling the nut in the market. The second-hand vendors who lost properties worth thousands of kina said it was the actions of few that have now cost them all they had. I want to go to the market for a long time now. I have plenty of time. I have to go to the market. 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 Reason blong mi blalo market blong blalo bagarap just because of all sampla man meri we no saarem tok tok arem tok tok we blong mi blalo all man meri lo manu emu sa stop sampla lo mangi mi blalo sa kopas lo stop mi lo sampla buayo drago kain senti no se kain bat all sa like lo megi megi mi eti ko na nau em ino sen man meri plan di turu plan di properties blong blalo bagarap all plan di senti no bagarap nau mi blalo simpi blalo bagarap sereso mi na sawe wana seni blalo bagarap biain long. The Malaro market has seen a rise of betel nut sellers in recent months. The market is known for its fish and garden produce. Quintana Lomp, National MTV News. Chief Secretary to the government, Sir Manasupe Zurino, has clarified that the power to effect disciplinary action on public servants lies with the minister responsible. Sir Manasupe said this following strong criticism from Tugubu landowner spokesman Simon Ekanda, who called on the Chief Secretary to be sacked as their landowner issues were yet to be addressed by the Department of Petroleum and Energy. Last week, Sir Manasupe called on the top government officers to submit their performance reports before January 16. Sir Manasupe was brief when he gave his response. He said his department completed the necessary paperwork for then Minister for Petroleum and Energy William Duma to discipline his secretary Randall Rimua. However, he says nothing has been done. In this uh, particular case that uh, my friend Simon Ekanda is talking about, uh, this particular officer, 
an appropriate investigation was, has, has been done. The matter was, in, in fact, going to be done. Uh, disciplinary action was going to be invoked by the previous minister in, 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 in that particular portfolio. He had moved on, so we've, we've, we've now briefed that to the new minister. He said they can only recommend to respective government ministers following any public complaints that the top heads of department and SOEs are not performing. As the chief secretary, Semana Supe said he doesn't have the power to fire government heads. Last week, Simon Ekanda, the Tuguba landowner spokesman, called on chief secretary to be sacked because he failed to discipline DP secretary Randall Rimua. Mr. Ekanda wrote to him, and my letter is with him, and he's still pending his, his actions on this. That is why, what, why his call on today's paper uh, Chief Crack's whip, the crack whip begins with him. However, this news did not go down well with a group representing 300,000 people of Hela. Uh, President of Hela Gimbo Association, Damien Arabagali, condemned Mr. Ekanda's remarks. He said it was a slap in the face for someone like Semana Supe, who pushed for Hela to become a province. Be, be careful of what you're saying and hurting other people that help us. When we were nobody, they dared to speak for us. So how can uh, you try to destroy uh, this particular fellow and say that, you know, Sir Manusuban, that you are incompetent, you shouldn't be doing this and that? Bridget Komatep, National MTV News. The National Planning and Monitoring Department plans to work in partnership with sister departments in 2015 to deliver its major projects. In its implementation program, it will complete its second medium-term development plan and the Planning Act. The Planning Act is the government's new development program that will be carried out by the department. It includes a service delivery framework that will ensure that three levels of government receive at least the medium level of services that is needed in their areas. One of the important things that National Planning is trying to do is to make sure that our long-term plans are good and correct and then we link it down to annual budget and we keep sailing MV Papua New Guinea towards that long-term vision. The Act aims to link the constitutional principles through the medium-term development plans. It will coincide with the five years political cycle, creating a standard framework that will act as a guideline for the new government. And that is why it's very important this year that I want to get through and table the Planning Act. And the Planning Act basically will link uh, the principles of the Constitution through the National Strategy for Responsible Sustainable Development, through a new medium-term development plan and ultimately connect it to the budget. The Act is also designed to monitor and evaluate the outcome of the service delivery structure. And so the Planning uh, Act would try and just create that basic uh, structure that we then with the resources provided by the government, to the different levels of government, we build and build and build that structure. When one member of parliament moves on, he's already laid this beginning. The other one just comes and continues to build that framework. Meanwhile, the department will be tabling the population, water and foreign aid policies next month. Vastinata Yama, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News tonight. Stories making headlines overseas when we return, including the historical mass in the Philippines where millions joined Pope Francis for mass. Good to have you back with the news. Turning overseas now, Pope Francis has made history before a sea of faithful in the Philippines. It's the largest mass ever held, but out of the millions in attendance, it was a special little girl that stole his heart and nearly brought him to tears. The turnout, six million strong, making this the largest papal mass ever. Just like his flock, the pontiff wearing a yellow poncho, the faithful braving the rain, lining the route to hear his call to protect the young, saying, And we need to care for our young people, not allowing them to be robbed of hope and condemned to the life on the streets. And among the six million, one striking moment, 12-year-old Glizel Palomar, a homeless girl rescued by the church, tearfully asking the pontiff why God allows children to become victims of crimes and why they suffer. 
The pontiff offers his blessing in his native Spanish and embraces her, offering these words. There are some realities that you can only see through eyes that have been cleansed by tears. A moving moment for the people's pope in what is perhaps a fitting end to his whirlwind six-day pilgrimage of Asia. After suffering months of abuse by Islamic State militants, about 200 of the Iraqi minority Yazidi group have been released. Last year, thousands of Yazidis fled to the mountains as ISIL attacked their village and communities. They are free, but they have nothing. For five months, these women, men and children have been held by Islamic State, now dumped near the city of Kirkuk with no explanation. Some are too shocked to even speak, while others tell stories of how they were taken and mistreated. I don't know the details of why they released us. They are very bad people. They took children and they took women. They did all the bad things with us. We've been humiliated by them. It was in August that thousands of Yazidis left their homes and all their belongings. Fleeing the town of Sinja and heading for the mountains after IS began their assault against the Yazidi community, demanding they convert to Islam. Helicopter rescue missions were unable to deal with the sheer numbers desperate to escape. The extremist group took hundreds hostage, and mainly women. Kurdish officials say the fact that some have been freed was totally unexpected. No, 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 no. Among the 200 are mainly the elderly, disabled and children, and it may have been they were slowing down the IS fighters as they tried to move on including these young boys. Their hands and faces marked where mosquito bites have become infected. They're now being cared for by Peshmerga soldiers and transported to refugee camps in Dahuk, where they can share with the authorities information that could help them find their relatives. Over to the US, the icy weather has wreaked havoc on roads across the country, causing more than 500 accidents. In Oregon, a man miraculously escapes after becoming sandwiched between two trucks. Along the East Coast today, a deadly mix. Freezing rain instantly icing over roadways. Look out! Look out! Sending cars out. out of control. In Philadelphia, three people were killed after more than 50 cars and trucks slammed into one another. Officials closing icy highways and all bridges in the city for four hours. Emergency officials urging drivers to stay home. What was it like walking? It's just, just like the right here is right now. It's just like a skate rink. Just like a skate rink on the highway. More than 30 vehicles were involved in this pileup on a New Jersey highway. 16 people were hurt, including this man who had to be dragged to safety. It's nearly three o'clock in the afternoon and they've just managed to clear this road from that massive crash. The rain is still coming down, but the temperatures are warmer, so it's not freezing on contact with the road. Out west, icy conditions too. In Oregon, an amazing story of survival after this 26 vehicle pileup ripped open a FedEx truck and mangled an 18 wheeler. Caleb Whitby, who was driving his pickup truck, was sandwiched between the two semis, leaving him just enough room to survive. The more I think of all the things that could have happened, and it, it kind of scares me. So I just thank my lucky stars that, it, that it's that's okay, you know, that I'm able to come home to my wife and son. Amazingly, Whitby only needed two band aids. Secret Service agents are searching the area around the U.S. Vice President's home after shots were fired nearby. Witnesses say they heard a vehicle speeding away. 825 Saturday night, shots rang out in this upscale neighborhood of Wilmington, Delaware. Joe and Jill Biden have had a home here for years. Secret Service agents saw a car speeding down this road a few hundred yards from the Vice President's house just outside the security perimeter. The Bidens were out to dinner when the shooting happened. They spend most of their weekends in Delaware, and the vice president has joked about their quiet neighborhood. We live in an area that's wooded and somewhat secluded. I said, Jill, if there's ever a problem, just walk out on the balcony here, or walk out, put that double-barrel shotgun, and fire two blasts. 
outside the house. But tonight, the Secret Service and the FBI are investigating whether someone actually shot at the Biden's house last night or whether it's all just a dangerous coincidence. Agents now are searching the neighborhood for bullets and shell casings. They don't want a repeat of the incident in 2011 when a gunman fired and hit the White House residence, and it took the Secret Service several days to realize that the White House had been hit. In this latest shooting, one man was detained and questioned, but the shooting remains very much a mystery. A modern-day Bonnie and Clyde couple has been arrested in the U.S. The teenagers had spent two weeks on the run after a massive crime spree across southern states. Exactly two weeks after a wild multi-state crime spree began, two teenage suspects in custody. Overnight, police in Panama City Beach, Florida, surrounding a stolen pickup truck. Sleeping inside, 18-year-old Dalton Hayes and 13-year-old Cheyenne Phillips, an alert Walmart shopper spotting them in a nearby store, calling in a tip. Soon, U.S. Marshals canvassing the area with their photo and vehicle description. We received information from the U.S. Marshals about a possible stolen vehicle and fugitives in our area and we were out tonight looking for that vehicle and we actually located the vehicle in the rear parking lot of the IHOP. The duo starting their alleged crime spree in Kentucky January 4th after reportedly getting engaged, destroying a cattle farm on the run through the Carolinas down to Georgia, allegedly breaking into homes, forging stolen checks and stealing three pickup trucks, the last one with loaded guns inside, their parents begging for their surrender. I don't know how much more I can take. I need, I need them home safe. Tonight, Hayes facing more than a dozen felony charges in several states, including burglary, possibly statutory rape. He and Phillips returning separately to Kentucky by week's end. Stay tuned. You're watching National Lame TV News. After the break, we'll bring you local headlines. Stay with us. Good to have you back with National MTV News. Now to our top local stories. The government's tuition fee free education will continue this year. That's the assurance from the Minister for Education, Nick Kuman. Mr. Kuman said that the 10,060 schools in PNG will receive their slice of the 300 million kina due to be released on the second week of February when schools start the academic year. The O'Neill Dion government has carried on its free education.